Hello and welcome to part four of the RSET webinar, Satellite Remote Sensing for Agricultural Applications. Wherever you are joining us from, we hope you're keeping safe and healthy. My name is Sean McCartney and I'm an Earth scientist at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. In part four of the webinar series, we'll be focusing on evapotranspiration and evaporative stress index for agricultural applications. In part one of the webinar series, we provided an overview of satellite remote sensing for agriculture, highlighting specific satellites and sensors and how to access these data products. In part two of the webinar series, we focused on soil moisture using NASA satellite observations and modeled products that provide critical information for drought monitoring, agricultural monitoring, and crop forecasting. In part three of the webinar series, we covered some of the main products and variables for cropland and rangeland monitoring and showcased operational agricultural monitoring and early warning systems. For the final part of this webinar series, we are delighted to have as a guest presenter, Dr. Christopher Hain, a research scientist at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Dr. Haynes' research inter interests include thermal infrared remote sensing with applications in surface energy balance modeling, soil moisture retrieval, hydrologic data assimilation, and drought monitoring. He's played a significant role in the development of the Atmosphere Land Exchange Inverse Model, or ALEXI. ALEXI is currently used to monitor continental evapotranspiration, soil moisture, and drought. Today, he'll be discussing the importance of evapotranspiration for agricultural applications, satellite methods for estimating evapotranspiration, case studies using the Alexi model, an overview of the evaporative stress index, as well as highlight an exciting new evapotranspiration monitoring tool he and his colleagues created in Google Earth Engine. As with previous sessions, each webinar in the series will have a one hour presentation followed by a 30 minute question and answer session. As a reminder, both homework assignments are due by May 12th. If you're interested in a certificate of completion, you must attend all the webinars and complete all the homework assignments. You will receive a certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinas Martin. I will now turn the presentation over to Dr. Hain to present on evapotranspiration for agricultural applications. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sean, for the introduction. Um, as, uh, as Sean said, um, I'm Dr. Christopher Hain. I am a research scientist at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, I've been working on essentially land surface remote sensing with a focus on evapotranspiration, drought, um, and working with a lot of agricultural applications for you know most of my career. Um, and today I'll kind of give you a presentation um, on some of the applications that uh, the community has developed for monitoring evapotranspiration and then you know essentially some derivative products from um, these models to look at agricultural applications related to evapotranspiration and drought. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, you know, for the most part, what is evapotranspiration? Um, you know, it's an important part of the water cycle, as you see here in the schematic, you know, we have everything from precipitation to how water flows back into the ground, um, is then available to vegetation. So when we talk about evapotranspiration, we're really worried about three main components of the water cycle, and that's evaporation from the soil surface. So a bare soil surface after precipitation, uh, there's, you know, a certain amount of water remains in the soil and uh, near the near the land surface atmosphere interface, that water is available for evaporation. Um, the other uh, main one and you know, one that's probably the most important when we talk about agricultural applications is transpiration from vegetation. So uh, this is in the process of uh, plants uh, essentially taking in carbon dioxide and releasing uh, water back into the atmosphere. Uh, transpiration occurs because um, plants have you know large rooting structures. They have a lot of availability of water within both the surface layer and in their root zone. Um, and transpiration really does make up a, a dominant part of uh, you know 
essentially the exchange of water from the land surface back to the atmosphere. And then there's one other uh, one other component. Um, essentially, this happens in very dense forest, uh, you know, in parts of the equatorial rainforests, Brazil, equatorial Africa, where you have very dense canopy structures, um, and actually you get precipitation that is essentially intercepted by that canopy. There's water on the leaves, water within the canopy structure, and that can then also be evaporated back into, into the atmosphere. So these three components really come up with the summation of what, what we call evapotranspiration. Um, like I said, because we're kind of focusing on an agricultural application here, uh, I really wanted to talk about, you know, what kind of, you know, this interface between the land surface and the atmosphere. So what controls transpiration from plants? Um, and, you know, the amount of water that plants can transpire, you know, it can greatly change over geographical areas and over time, season. Um, and there's a number of factors that can determine essentially how effective transpiration can occur from vegetation. Um, the first one is temperature. Uh, transpiration rates go up as temperature goes up. Um, especially during the growing season when the air is warmer. Uh, so essentially during the cold season, when you have active vegetation, the plant does not you know, release as much water as when you have uh, essentially in the warm season when you have um, you know, more hot conditions. And, um, and this kind of goes with the atmospheric moisture part of the second control is you know, warmer temperatures can hold more mo moisture, um, but also, the amount of humidity or, or water vapor in the air also controls um, transpiration. Um, as the air becomes more moist, the transpiration rates can fall. Um, this is because there's not as much of a gradient between the leaf and the atmosphere. Um, and so your, your ability to, the ability for the plant to actually release water is, is, is lowered as the humidity rises. And this mainly means that it's easier to evaporate water into drier air than more saturated air. Um, there is an additional con additional consideration here that you know when um, plants become stressed, um, when they have less soil moisture, soil available water in their rooting system, plants can also tend to regulate their own water use. So sometimes when plants become stressed and the humidity is very low. Uh, plants might pull back their transpiration rates to conserve water. So the moisture component is kind of a more complicated control. Uh, but generally, you know, in a well-watered plant, it's easier for the plant to transpire into drier air than more uh, humid air. Um, the third one that we worry about is wind. Um, increased movement of air around the plant uh, results in a higher transpiration rate. Um, and this essentially helps because as turbulence can mix drier air near the plant surface, kind of tying back into that prior control uh, where it's easier to evaporate into drier air than, than the more saturated air. Uh, so when wind increases, it, uh, more effect, it, it allows the plant to be more effective in, in transpiring. And then the one that I, I kind of was also talking about is soil moisture. You know, when moisture becomes lacking, uh, plants will begin to conserve water in a way of trying to, you know, essentially not, you know, go into a dormant state or to have, you know, suffer from, you know, essentially the the, the ability for the plant to, you know, essentially stay alive. Um, and so it'll transpire less water. Um, you know, so these four controls, they're all kind of tied together in some sense. And, um, you know, no single one, um, really dominates the structure. It's really this, how they all interact together is really, you know, how we understand and, and understand how that plant interacts with the atmosphere and with that exchange of water. So now that we kind of understand, you know, what is ET, we'll call it ET going forward, um, evapotranspiration. Um, why do we need to measure it for agricultural applications? Um, this is probably not a complete list, but you know, this is, I think, you know, maybe if you had to pick five ways that, you know, us scientists in the community work with stakeholders in the agricultural sector to use remote sensing data to measure ET. Um, the first one, irrigation management. Essentially, in areas where crops are irrigated and not rain fed, um, 
our ability to measure ET allows us to give better information to farmers on when and how much to irrigate. Uh, the second one, monitoring drought and crop stress. Uh, this kind of goes a bit with irrigation management. You know, we want to make sure that we're able to measure ET so that we can find out when a plant may be undergoing stress. And in that sense, if it's an irrigated plant, you know, you can work with the farmer to, to, to do a better management program. Uh, if it is rain fed, then you can start to hopefully have some mitigating factors for how to mitigate some of the impacts of drought and crop stress, or just to give an early warning of, you know, downstream effects when it comes to, uh, you know, end of year yield or impacts on, you know, a decreased amount of, of food that could be, you know, essentially harvested or grown from that crop. Um, and that's also goes into this third point, yield prediction. Um, you know, through the growing season, we, you know, a, a lot of scientists work with economists and others within the, you know, that sector to try to understand what the final yields of certain crops will be globally. Um, and this is important for a global market, it's important for areas that are food insecure. So our ability to measure ET helps us when it comes to trying to predict what end of season yields will be. Um, the fourth one, water use accounting. Um, this is an interesting one because it's once again in areas where we may not have plentiful water, but yet we need a lot of water for irrigation practices. It's important for us to understand how much water certain crops use. And so this water use accounting is, and we'll have an example later in the presentation of how this works, but it's really important to understand how certain crops use water and how much they do so that essentially strategies can be made to uh, figure out what is the most effective use of the water in, in some of these areas like California, where we have you know, essentially water security issues and not enough water to really irrigate as much as we would like to. And then crop water productivity, you know, essentially this, somewhat the same kind of, you know, uh, idea with water use accounting is, you know, how much, you know, how much of a crop can you grow per unit of water and, you know, and making more educated decisions on, you know, what crops to plant given areas where there is a limited amount of water. So, I wanted to go through the next couple of slides talking about how we measure ET in a couple of different ways. Um, first off, you know, we actually have ground-based methods for measuring evapotranspiration. Um, and the two main ones are essentially eddy covariants. Um, these are instruments that are essentially put on towers um, over a field, over an area where you would like to understand kind of the dynamics of evapotranspiration. And essentially it's looking at really, really fast measurements of fluctuations of vertical wind speed and essentially water vapor. And by looking at those very, very fast changes and fluctuations, we're able to estimate how much water is being evaporated or transpired from the surface. Um, as you might imagine, these systems are complicated. They're, it takes a very specialized person to understand how to actually place these um, to get the most accurate measurements. Um, and it's not like going out and measuring a temperature with a thermometer. There's still uncertainty in air with even these observational systems. So that's really complicated for measuring ET is that even our quote unquote ground-based observation systems have uncertainty. We don't necessarily measure it as perfectly as we can measure other things. Um, but these are kind of our ability to have some ground truth to these uh, measurements. And the, the second me measurement is a called a lysimeter. Um, it's, it's another relatively complicated observation system where you're actually building an apparatus within the soil surface that's able to weigh a soil column continuously and essentially back out how much water has been evaporated by changes in the weight of that soil column. Um, you know, I think the other real take home message is both of these methods are pretty cost prohibitive. They're very expensive to, to build, they're very expensive to maintain. Um, and frankly, that's why we only have several hundred of them to measure ET globally. So, you know, having direct measurements of ET from these observational systems is not something that we could do everywhere. Um, it really serves as the ground truth and the validation for some of the methods we'll talk about in the next few slides of how we measure ET from both a modeling standpoint and a remote sensing standpoint. 
so models. Um, you know, there's a couple of, you know, ways that we can essentially, you know, much like we use models to predict the weather, we can use models to predict energy, water, and momentum fluxes between the land surface and the atmosphere. Um, essentially, we, you know, we derive and build computational models to use these physics to understand or to model what we have as an understanding of that interface between the land surface and the atmosphere. Um, so with land data simulation systems and land surface models that are able to predict these energy and water fluxes, um, we constrain them with essentially observed atmospheric conditions. You know, we know the temperature, we, you know, we can measure the wind, we can measure the humidity. Um, and then essentially we have model, models with it or physics within those models to estimate rates of evapotranspiration, changes in soil moisture. Um, so everything that we understand about the system um, we put into these models. Unfortunately, we don't always have this, the, the most accurate observations to force these models, and a lot of the physics are very complicated, and so we have to really parameterize, which is essentially a way of making some broader assumptions about how some of these physics work when we don't have the observations to truly um, model them to the most, you know, accurate sense. Um, and so, you know, from an advantage standpoint, you know, these models are nice because they can be run anywhere where you have the forcing data. Um, you know, even if that forcing data is coarse or maybe not as accurate, you know, take, for example, Africa, we don't have a lot of ground-based meteorological information compared as to, you know, an observational network over the United States. Um, so that introduces some uncertainty. Um, another advantage is that, you know, it, it provides complete temporal resolution and, you know, information of ET over the day. You can run the model and output what the model is estimating ET at any time of the day. Uh, so it gives you a full, complete temporal picture, and you're able to run these at varying spatial resolutions. Um, you know, some models run all the way down to 500 meters or one kilometer. Um, some global ones are more on the 5 to 25 kilometer. Um, so you have a lot of flexibility in, in, in what you want to model. Um, Disadvantages. I mean, with anything with ET, you will, every method will have its advantages and disadvantages. And it's not so much that we have a clear cut way to model or, you know, either from a model or a remote sensing standpoint to estimate ET. Um, we really have to kind of work within the constraints of each method uh, to give us a more complete picture. So the disadvantages of models, you know, like I said, we have errors in atmospheric forcing. Um, the main driver to land surface models is precipitation. If your precipitation is not right, you're already starting off with some level of uncertainty in what the soil moisture will be and then the downstream effects on ET accuracy. Uh, if your precipitation is poor, your soil moisture prediction will be poor. That will affect your, your, your estimation of evapotranspiration. So really the errors in the atmospheric forcing um, can cause a lot of issues with producing essentially less certain estimates of ET. Um, and also we can experience model drift. And this happens where essentially these errors accumulate, errors in the forcing or the model physics can accumulate and we can get to a point where a model becomes biased, it becomes too wet or too dry. And, you know, so all these errors and all this uncertainty essentially, you know, kind of downstream feeds the additional uncertainties, and especially in, in this case, the measurement we're trying to, you know, model is ET. Um, so, you know, you have to kind of take all of this into effect and uh, try to understand uh, what your best method for estimation is. So that gets us into, you know, really what the core of some of what uh, our work is focused on, which is using satellites to estimate evapotranspiration. Um, there's a number of different methods to do this. Um, I start off here with one of the more simple methods, but it's a very strong method when you're looking at, you know, trying to estimate ET for agricultural applications, uh, especially when you know a lot about the crop that you're trying to measure ET. Um, so in a crop coefficient or ETO, which is a potential or a reference ET, um, I'll get to what, what, what reference ET means in a minute. So essentially we're trying to calculate evapotranspiration by computing a measure of what the reference ET is. Reference ET is essentially the amount of ET that would occur under well-watered conditions. Um, 
And we can estimate that from an agricultural weather station because it's a function of things like solar radiation, temperature, moisture, all those atmospheric controls that we talked about earlier in the presentation. And then applying a crop coefficient. So essentially, a crop coefficient is very specific to a given crop. Um, and it tells you how much, given the reference ET, you would expect that plant to transpire. Um, that being said, those crop coefficients are, it's really good when a farmer is able to understand what crop is in his field or her field and to apply a crop coefficient that is relevant. And so this requires a lot of human interaction to try to, you know, do this in a way that, you know, is able to provide an accurate measure. And so one of the established methods um, is a NASA program that's run out of NASA Ames, um, the, the NASA Satellite Irrigation Management Support System. And this uses a crop coefficient method over most of the Western United States, especially in California, where we have good remote sensing information and good crop data to uh, come up with an, uh, an automated way to estimate uh, crop coefficient based on NDVI and estimates of crop height and estimates of what crops are grown in what field. Um, that being said, the, you know, the main limitation of this method and why it's a good agricultural method for irrigated agriculture, but maybe not so good in rain fed agriculture is that there is less sensitivity to, you know, changes in ET related to deficit irrigation or changes in stress. It's really good at estimating evapotranspiration when we have a good understanding that the, the plant is well watered. Um, and as we go to the next slide, um, this is really where a lot of the the next method uh, being focused on energy balance methods um, or maybe more broadly applied to different types of agricultural applications and actually monitoring ET over, you know, lots of different um, ecosystems, forests, grassland, uh, wetlands. Um, and so the real theory behind a surface energy balance uh, method is we know how much energy is coming at the surface from short wave and long wave radiation. We can measure that um, with meteorological data and satellite data. And the amount of energy available at the surface is balanced by fluxes from surface heating and the exchange of water vapor. So the exchange of water vapor being ET. And so we know given all the energy that comes to the surface, how it's partitioned between heating the surface and then energy that's used to evaporate water from the surface. Um, Really, energy balance models can be divided into two categories. Um, one, a single source energy balance model. Uh, this is where the model takes the vegetation and soil and analyzes it in a combined energy budget. Um, these were essentially the first energy balance models um, uh, kind of conceived you know, a number of decades ago. Um, one of the disadvantages is that you know, the 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 exchange of you know heat and moisture from the vegetation and soil are handled very differently. So when you combine them into one energy budget, it requires a lot of assumptions and kind of corrections that make single source energy mo balance models sometimes hard to apply in an automated sense without this calibration. Um, to kind of address some of those issues, a number of researchers had, you know, essentially developed two source energy balance models, which handle the vegetation and soil energy budgets separately. Um, and this gets away from having to do that calibration or that correction of, of, of considering the vegetation and the soil is one component by allowing the vegetation and soil, which can then be categorized given its actual characteristics in a, in, in a two source energy balance model uh, has been shown to, you know, lead to more accurate um, partitioning between the energy fluxes between vegetation and then bare soil. So um, I won't go into many of these, um, but I, I left them here for um, just kind of an example of some of the methods that have been developed over the last number of decades. Um, and then the relevant citation that you know, anybody can go and kind of read up more on these. But you know, these are kind of, you know, not, like I said, not a, full list of you know, energy balance methods, but really represent some of the, the, the foundational development of these types of methods. And you know, most of these methods have been continually developed and you know, you'll see as we go into the presentation where some of them will pop up. My background has really been with the atmosphere land exchange inverse, Alexi and Dyslexi model, which is a two source energy balance model. Um, the Alexi component, 
essentially is the, the global or regional version that runs on moderate resolution. And then Dissel XE is the, the essentially the, the high resolution field scale estimation tool um, that uses high resolution uh, remote sensing information from sensors such as Landsat and Sentinel-2. Uh, and we'll talk some more about that as we keep going. So, um, like I said, most of the rest of the presentation will focus on Alexi and some of the applications that uh, we have developed for agricultural and other applications, both in measuring evapotranspiration and looking at drought and vegetation stress. But like I said, it, you know, I think the main take home message is that all of these, even the energy balance models, all have their um, advantages and disadvantages and have been shown to be you know some models perform well in some you know some regimes and some perform better in other regimes and the real take-home message you know the et community especially from a remote sensing standpoint is is rather collaborative and you'll see that uh, as we get to the end of this presentation and some of the future work that we're doing is that really the community is moving towards looking at estimation of evapotranspiration from a, an ensemble standpoint of understanding when you know, we, that we get more certain estimations of ET if we take an ensemble of methods rather than relying on just one method that may do well in one regime but not do well in another regime. And what we're finding is when we are able to understand the advantages and disadvantages of each of these methods, um, providing an ensemble with um, both provides us a better, more accurate estimation and then also a level of uncertainty. Um, which is something we'll always deal with with measuring evapotranspiration is you know trying to minimize the amount of uncertainty but understanding that you know even our observational systems are not a direct measurement and, and neither are our remote sensing or modeling methods so um this is a little bit of a maybe difficult converse you know a difficult slide to look at but we'll try to walk you through you know some of the the physics of you know some of this at least alexi in an energy balance sense so what you see on the left is essentially the representation of a two source model. Um, you have essentially resistances that explain the exchange of heat and water, or uh, yeah, what, heat and water from the, the, the bare soil surface and then the exchange of water and heat from the vegetation surface. And then those are essentially um, coupled with essentially the atmosphere above them. And then the exchange between those two, those two components in the atmosphere. Um, that blending height you see there, that's kind of, think of it as the, you know, an interface between the atmosphere and the land surface. Um, so really to estimate these fluxes correctly, you need to know the temperature at that blending height. Um, unfortunately, you know, we don't have, you know, a way to directly measure that, uh, that height. Um, you know, we have models but you know if the model is not consistent with what you're seeing with the remote sensing data those will not be they'll they'll be out of you know they won't be consistent so it, it can lead to large errors in what we see so the main the main real additional development for alexi from you know its original two source model implementation was to couple the two source energy balance model with a, a boundary layer model above it so that we can actually model that temperature of at the blending height based on what we were seeing from the changes in land surface temperature. So land surface temperature, we, we measure that from satellite and Alexi is really driven and most of these energy balance models are driven by that land surface temperature. Um, Alexi uses a change in land surface temperature in the mid morning. Um, that's been shown to be coupled with that partitioning between heating and evaporation. Um, you know, because evaporation is a cooling process, um, you know, a satellite pixel, which is evaporating at a high rate will heat up slower than one that is drier and not evaporating at a higher rate. So that's the main core of the physics of the model is, you know, using this change in land surface temperature to understand how much of that energy is being converted into evaporating water uh, from the land surface back into the atmosphere. And so this, this coupling of the, the boundary layer model allows us to keep these two systems in balance um, and gets us away from having to measure that temperature at the blending height. Um, and that's really, you know, one of the main additions of what um, essentially has become this model um, that we've been you know, developed in the 90s and now still use today. 
So one more way of kind of looking at this is, you know, what you see here is on the left is a water balance approach. So think of this as how when we were talking about land surface models and land data simulation systems, these are all the physics we had to try to parameterize and mainly driving this was the precipitation um, and understanding how all of these systems um, interact to be able to estimate transpiration and evaporation. Uh, for an energy balanced approach, essentially what we're doing is, like I said, we're giving the known radiative inputs and we can calculate how much water has to be lost or evaporated back into the atmosphere to keep the soil and vegetation at the observed temperature rates. So there's two different methods, but you know, the, one of the advantages is that we're, we're measuring evapotranspiration with these two methods Yet they're they're being driven by you know essentially observations that are not 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 do not have correlated errors. So when we have both of these methods giving us you know consistent estimates of some of these energy fluxes, it gives us a little bit more certainty that um, we're getting. So that's why you know when we talk about having an ensemble approach to estimating evapotranspiration, that's really what we're trying to do is have different methods of trying to get at the same observation. And when those agree, it gives us more certainty that uh, we're measuring them accurately. Um, real quick slide, this kind of shows the real power of this multi-sensor, multi-scale ET mapping system that we have with Alexi and Dyslexi. Um, like I said, mainly driven by land surface temperature. Um, we, we, we measure land surface temperature at varying spatial and temporal resolutions. Uh, we have geostationary sensors that measure uh, land surface temperature over most of the globe um, in the more moderate resolution, two to four kilometers. We have polar orbiting sensors such as MODIS and VIRS that can measure twice daily land surface temperature uh, at the 375 meter to two kilometer range. And then we have much higher resolution information from sensors like Landsat that give us, you know, essentially once every eight or 16 day uh, measurements of land surface temperature at the field scale. Um, so being able to understand um, a modeling system that's able to consistently balance energy inputs across all these scales really shows the power of our Alexi modeling system. One of the issues with Landsat is that we only get it, you know, once every eight or 16 days and we, we need those retrievals without clouds. So, you know, sometimes we have areas where we can go a number of weeks without a, a clear Landsat overpass. Uh, and sometimes the change in ET is occurring on timescales that happens in between Landsat overpasses where you may get a rainfall event and you know you may not see the impact on the evapotranspiration until the next Landsat overpass. So what our team has really focused on is finding ways to integrate moderate resolution into our modeling system. And so what you see here on the on the on day 328 and day 336, we had two Landsat overpasses, um, and then deriving information between relationships between MODIS and Landsat, we were able to fill in the 30 meter ET uh, based on the MODIS overpass on those other days. So giving us a full daily estimation of, of field scale evapotranspiration. And as we look here, this is kind of an example of what happens. Um, so this is a, a, a um, time series of evapotranspiration over a cornfield in Iowa. And what you see here on this top chart is that the, the, red, the red squares were Landsat overpass days. Um, and without this kind of data fusion of fusing some of the moderate resolution information, as you saw, there was a number of rain events in between those two Landsat overpass days. And that red dotted line is essentially what the ET would have been if we had just not used the MODIS information in between the Landsat overpass days. And then that dark red line was diffusion. Um, and that the blue dots are essentially the observation. So you see the data fusion really was able to capture these rain events in between Landsat overpass days. And the real take home message on the bottom plot is with the dark, with the solid red and the solid blue line, our, our, our data fusion method matched observations much closer than if we had just only used Landsat. So it really shows the power of this integration of moderate resolution LST or land surface temperature into the modeling system to get at some of these changes in evapotranspiration in between Landsat overpass days. Um, another real 
interesting um, application is, you know, starting to then integrate even higher resolution um, uh, land surface temperatures from, uh, we can do this from unmanned aerial vehicles, aircraft, where we can really start to get at intra-field ET variability. So this is an example of ET over a, a grape field in California. Um, what you see here on the left is essentially the yield. Um, and as you see over the you know, over the field, there was a large variability in, in actual yield. Um, some areas had much higher yield than other areas. Um, and we were able to start to see that with both the Landsat ET at 30 meters and this aircraft that, you know, water use can vary large, can significantly vary over, over a field. Um, so this really is the power of getting this type of information into the hands of agricultural stakeholders because um, they can make decisions on, you know, why per certain parts of the field may be stressed. Um, you know, a lot of times this has to do with, you know, the dynamics of soil, um, drainage. Uh, so it really allows them to understand water use within a field, not just looking at something that might give them one picture of like their field from a lower resolution, really allows them to understand what, you know, essentially what they ended up getting and yielding at the end of their season and essentially the water use dynamics during uh, the season within that field. Um, I'm gonna walk kind of through a case study. Um, and this is essentially, you know, we've been working a number of years with, you know, e j Gallo, which is a large wine producer in the Central Valley in California. Um, and they have really shown a lot of interest in trying to integrate remote sensing information into essentially their management practices uh, within, their, within their vineyards. Um, so we've been working on this GrapeX project for a number of years, um, measuring, uh, you know, essentially field scale evapotranspiration in a number of their research fields. Um, and two, two of the sites here are um, in, near Lodi, California. Uh, we've been measuring ET for them over this region for, you know, back from 2013 to present. And we're actually trying to do this in real time so they can actually make decisions on how to irrigate and manage their, their vineyards. Um, this is another example of just kind of like the year to year variability in these two fields. Um, and essentially a, a validation, we, you know, we have eddy covariance flux towers in each of these fields to kind of validate some of the methods that we're, we're developing. And as you see here on the top, you see kind of the change in, in, in water use over the, over the, the three years here, 2014 to 2016, and then a time series of both the modeled and the measured. And for the most part, you know, we underestimate a little bit sometimes in very high evaporative demand. Um, sometimes, you know, these scenarios where you get a lot of dry, hot air, um, this particular field being in, in, the, in the hot portion of the Central Valley in California, uh, it can be very hot and um, you know, measuring some of the, measuring ET under those conditions sometimes is, is the most complicated and difficult. But for the most part, um, we've shown good validation uh, of the method for, for over vineyards. Um, another example here, uh, this is another thing that's focused on the San Joaquin Valley in California. Um, as I mentioned earlier, water accounting is a, another really important um, tool. Um, we're really trying to understand in this in this in this river basin where um, the water is being used. Uh, what you see here on in, on the right uh, for 2015 and 2016 is the USDA crop data layer um, that tells us essentially in every field what kind of crop was being grown. Um, and you see it in the legend that we have everything from corn to alfalfa to tomatoes to vineyards to almonds to you know fields that have been fallowed or not being used that season. And then an estimate of our Alexi evapotranspiration for a 10 day period during the, the peak of the growing season. Does this show you that certain crops use a lot more water than other crops. And that's really where water accounting comes into play of trying to understand the dynamics of, of how much water is being used and for what. Um, so exactly, this kind of is the take home message. So because we were able to measure evapotranspiration at high resolutions over this, over this area, and then we had high resolution information about what was being grown in each field, we were able to actually break out water use per unit area um, by certain crops. Um, 
you know, so some of the bigger water users, almonds, rice, um, walnuts, olives, and then you have some of the, you know, lower water use crops like uh, tomatoes, vineyards, um, pistachios. Uh, so it really gets to the point where understanding where every unit of water goes and to, you know, how effective uh, a certain crop uses uh, a, a unit of water. And then we can do something like this where we actually can use over the season, understand when crops use the most water. Um, I think this is ex an interesting thing, you know, you get this, this, this uh, kind of peak in the, in the rice crop where it's using a lot more water than other crops. Um, but ultimately, you know, you get a sense of how much water is being used to produce a certain amount of uh, a certain amount of food. And so this is very important for for areas that are trying to do a better job of managing, you know, essentially a finite amount of water, like in an area where California, where agriculture is a very really important economic sector. But, you know, there's only so much water and, no, you know, limits on pumping water from the ground. And so it's very important to have methods to understand how water is being used. So one other thing, you know, this kind of is something that's been an important integration of uh, a new observation into our modeling system. So, you know, our, our method really does rely on, you know, the thermal infrared wavelengths to measure land surface temperature. So these, these only allow us to measure land surface temperature and then subsequently evapotranspiration when there are no clouds. Um, and that can be problematic in a lot of areas. Um, you know, we can go, there are, there are areas in equatorial Africa, the Ethiopian highlands, where even during the growing season, they can have drought and crop stress, but we don't, because it's such a cloudy area, we don't actually get enough real certain clear sky retrievals to get a good understanding of what's happening on the ground. So this led us to really trying to figure out how to exploit microwave wavelengths, which are not as sensitive to clouds. Uh, they can see through clouds to measure land surface temperature um, as long as there's not heavy precipitation within the cloud. So it gives us a lot more information, albeit at a coarser spatial resolution, um, but still no inf coarser information is still better than no information in a lot of these areas where the integration of microwave land surface temperature is really helping us get more certain um, estimates of land surface temperature and subsequently evapotranspiration. So here's just an example over you know, equatorial Africa and the Ethiopian highlands. As you see here on the left, this is uh, uh, an estimate of evapotranspiration just using thermal infrared. So as you see kind of in the, in the, in the equatorial rainforest, um, we get a lot of this speckle and noise. And that's just because of the uncertainty of being able to clear out the clouds. Um, that contamination gets into our system and it causes us to have errors and uncertainty. Um, if you look at the microwave version, we don't have that. Um, and so we get a much clearer picture of what's actually happening. And in this sense, the cloud issues were really causing us to underestimate evapotranspiration in this area, in a lot of these areas where the microwave gave us much more certain observations with a lot less variability and noise. And so this actually will feed downstream into our higher resolution information because the, the what we're essentially retrieving at these scales serves as that boundary condition for those Landsat scales. So we have to measure ET at this scale correctly first if we expect to measure it accurately at the Landsat scale. So we're gonna switch topic slightly. Um, we're still going to be talking about evapotranspiration, um, but kind of looking at it from a case study of looking at how we use some of this information to monitor and provide early warning for agricultural drought. Um, I show this a lot when I talk about drought. This is kind of how the atmosphere and some of the remote sensing time scales for drought early warning kind of go hand in hand. Um, as you see in the top, you know, Usually the precursors of drought are either one or both of these two real atmospheric drivers, high atmospheric demand. So atmospheric demand is the thirst, the, all, those, all those controls we talked about before, temperature, wind, moisture. When all of them kind of all point to enhanced evapotranspiration, it can very rapidly dry out the, the land surface. Um, those tend to be correlated with periods of below normal precipitation. 
Um, so you have a high thirst of the atmosphere pulling water out of the land surface and then below average precipitation or recharge of that soil moisture. Um, so you can start a, a growing season with sufficient soil moisture. Um, as you know, these atmospheric controls start to lead to degradation of the surface soil moisture, you can measure that with microwave soil moisture. Um, as the root zone dries out, you start to see onset of vegetation stress. Um, our thermal-based method with Alexi and uh, a derivative product called the Evaporative Stress Index, which I'll talk about in the next slide, really is looking at the plant dynamics of the onset of vegetation stress. And then, you know, you look at something where the vegetation is now to the point where it's becoming damaged, it's turning brown, it might not be as green as it's supposed to be. You can start to use NDVI to see that. Um, so really, you've got to use these different observations because they, they represent different time scales of the process um, in an agricultural drought. So I'll talk about two real new, you know, relatively new products that are focused on using, you know, essentially both evaporative demand and actual evapotranspiration for, for looking at drought. The first one is called the Evaporative Drought Demand Index, or EDI. Um, it really uses the strong physical relationship between demand and actual water loss. And like I said, demand can really be explained as the thirst of the atmosphere, um, or how much water would evaporate for the land surface under well water conditions. Um, so EDI really provides a signal of potential for future drought by looking at essentially how thirsty the atmosphere is to, est to essentially estimate the potential impact on the land surface. Um, the one caveat with Eddie is that it doesn't actually physically tie to actual land surface conditions. It can only show you the potential for the development of drought. It can't actually show you actual drought in isolation uh, because it doesn't have any information. It's just an atmospheric indicator. It doesn't actually know if the plant is well watered, what's the soil moisture conditions, or what's the actual evapotranspiration. So it's really just, it's a tool that has to be used with other tools to validate if there's actually a full, an actual tie back to the land surface that we're actually seeing impact in evapotranspiration rates or soil moisture to really validate if any is showing that potential for drought, if it's actually turning into an actual drought. Um, this is just an example of uh, the website here. Um, they, they run the, they run Eddie, you know, kind of in a, a near operational, near real time uh, manner um, to kind of track changes in, in this evaporative demand index um, for drought. Um, so the one that, you know, our team has developed um, is called the evaporative stress index. And what we're really looking at is anomalies in the ratio of actual to potential or that thirst uh, potential is that thirst of the atmosphere. But because Alexi gives us actual ET, we're actually able to tie both actual ET to the potential, which gives us a physical tie to what's actually happening on the ground and within the plant. Um, one of the advantages of ESI is that it doesn't require precipitation data. Uh, we're deducing the soil moisture straight directly from land surface temperature. Uh, so we don't need to know precipitation. We don't need to know soil moisture. We're, we're deducing the current soil moisture state of the vegetation directly by this land surface temperature driven model. Um, it provides early warning because we can start to see signals in the land surface temperature before you start to see deterioration of vegetation health. Um, that's because plants are relatively smart. Plants will start to regulate their water use um, by closing their stomata and limiting transpiration when they become stressed. This leads to essentially Remember, because evaporation is a cooling process, if it starts to slow its evaporation in a way of trying to conserve water, the leaf temperatures are going to heat up faster. We see that with the land surface temperature that we can retrieve from uh, satellite. So essentially, we're seeing that onset of stress before the plant's actually looking like it's damaged or decreasing its greenness. Um, another big advantage is that you know we include non-precipitation moisture signals. Um, I don't need to know if a plant or a field is being irrigated. Uh, we don't need to know if vegetation is rooted to the groundwater. Because as long as we can measure the land surface temperature, we are seeing what the plant sees. And that allows us to know um, if there's being some impact from a drought to changes in water use. Um, this is just an example. We run this model both regionally and globally. Um, this is a version of our global model. It kind of looks what it looks like. 
Um, uh, towards the end of the presentation, we'll, we'll have some links to where you can get this data and look at it. Um, we run this model in near real time too, and uh, all the retrospective and real time data is hosted on Amazon Web Services and made available to the community for use. Um, so we'll definitely provide that to the to the to the participants at, at the end of the presentation. Um, so some of you have kind of maybe started to hear this idea of like flash droughts, these rapidly occurring. We've had a number of them over the United States in the last couple of years and decade. Uh, elsewhere in the United States, essentially where we can go to from relatively normal conditions to you know very uh, dry and, and anomalous drought conditions in a matter of weeks to a month. Most people think of drought as a slow evolving uh, phenomenon. Um, what we've learned though is that in especially agricultural interests, we can have these flash droughts which are really just been driven by precipitation deficits, hot temperatures, strong winds, um, you know, less clouds so you have more solar radiation, more energy at the surface to evaporate, um, and this is an example in 2017 of, of a, a very damaging uh, flash drought in the in the Dakotas in eastern Montana, where, as you see in early May, we we didn't have we had mostly normal to a wetter than normal conditions. Uh, one month later, most of the Dakotas were in pretty significant drought, and then by the beginning of July, the whole most of the area and a lot of the, the agricultural interests, both from a crop and a rangeland standpoint, were in you know significant you know D2 to D4 drought. Um, and you know the economic impacts of these flash droughts are, are are significant, and our ability to try to mitigate and understand and provide early warning of them has become a, a real thrust of new research in the in the drought community. And these ET methods, such as ESI and some of the other methods, have really shown the ability to look to provide us some early warning so that some mitigation strategies can be applied. Um, another application, we talked about crop yield anomalies um, and predicting those. Um, what we're also understanding is one way of trying to better predict crop yield anomalies is understanding um, water conditions um, through the growing season. Um, some crops are, you know, yield is driven by, or changes in yield can be driven by when stress is occurring within the crop stage. Uh, for example, um, corn, you know, there's a, there's a certain part of the corn growth stage where if it experienced stress, it's going to lead to significant degradations and, and, and final, you know, end of season yield. Um, this is really highlighted. I'll try to walk through this slowly to try to understand. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting case study, and it's one that's close to home here because it occurred in, in northern Alabama. But during the 2012 flash drought, um, as you saw here, if you want to focus on the corn, um, you know, we had you know, negative corn yield anomalies here in northern Alabama and, and, and Tennessee, where essentially the, the stress occurred when it was in that pivotal growth stage. Um, we got out of our flash drought relatively quickly at the beginning of August and September, and we had much less stress for our soybeans. So we actually had above average soybean yield and below average corn yield just because of when the flash drought occurred here. So it shows that it's it's not so much, you know, in a season did a flash drought occur, it's when did the when did the crop go through the stress and at what stage did it happen? Um, and so this has just been, you know, these case studies that we continually develop over as we go through more growing seasons to understand how to use this information to provide better estimates of, of crop yield anomalies. Um, so I'll kind of close with uh, a couple of slides for maybe some future stuff. Um, our research team, along with a lot of the researchers that you saw from some of the other energy balance models, have uh, all worked together to kind of build this Earth Google Earth Engine ET monitoring system um, to look at essentially field scale evapotranspiration for agricultural applications in the Western US. Uh, water issues in the Western US are really big and really important and having a means to estimate evapotranspiration in, in real time is very important. So this project called OpenET, it's, you know, we're still under development. I have the link there if you want to start taking a look at it. But, you know, over the next couple of years, you'll start to hear more about this. And I'll kind of just walk you through some of the examples of, you know, being able to have essentially a cloud-based cloud -based platform where uh, a stakeholder can go in and essentially, you know, interrogate 
water use using a number of different methods at these field scales um, and produce reports and, and, and have an understanding of the water use um, of different crops um, in the Western US. So now I'll just finish up the presentation with a with a couple of slides about a, a new mission that was launched in the last couple of years. Um, a lot of you probably have heard of it, EcoStress, which is a, a thermal imager that is on the International Space Station um, on one of the science ports on, on the space station. Um, this is essentially a Landsat-like uh, sensor from a from a thermal standpoint. So it just has five thermal bands. Um, essentially at a resolution of between 40 and 60, 70 uh, meters. Um, one of the issues is that we don't have the, the visible and near infrared information that we need for some of the vegetation information. So we essentially fuse that with the closest Landsat overpass, which creates some issues with making sure that the, the two images are consistent. Um, but given that you know we, we have limited uh, thermal information as it is, um, this is still a, an important addition to looking at how to uh, estimate evapotranspiration from thermal infrared observations. Um, what's nice about this sensor, because the, the orbit of the International Space Station is obviously different than what a polar orbiting sensor might, might be, might be um, we have a much higher revisit time uh, on the order of four days, where um, four days, you know, essentially, you know, in the, near the equator and in the tropics. And then sometimes as we get, you know, because of the, the orbit of the International Space Station, we only get coverage from about 50 south to 50 north in latitude. Um, and because of that, we get uh, more, more frequent observations over uh, a belt, essentially from 40 to 50 degrees uh, of latitude. So it's, it's an interesting orbit. Um, it gives us uh, obviously more information than we get from some of the thermal information that we get from Landsat. And the other really interesting part, which is one of the science questions that EcoStress really tried to focus on is, um, you know, with Landsat, we get a thermal overpass at the same time, roughly every every time it overpasses the point on the Earth. And that's in the late morning. Um, because of the orbit of the International Space Station, we actually have a variable overpass anywhere from 7 to 5 p.m. local time, 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. local time. Um, so it allows us to look at thermal signatures during different parts of the day. Um, this is important because a lot of, you know, from an agricultural standpoint, we might look at stress occurring in the in the late afternoon that we wouldn't necessarily see from a late morning observation in Landsat. And so that are some of the science questions we're trying to ask. Um, if you go to the next slide, this is kind of what you can get at. Um, this is essentially some center pivot irrigation agriculture in the Nile Basin in Africa and Egypt. And as you can see, these are two different overpasses, one occurring in the, in, the, in the morning and then one occurring in the afternoon. And so we're able to actually look at water use dynamics throughout the day, where with, from a Landsat standpoint, we'd only ever keep getting the same uh, observation time uh, for each of the overpasses. Um, so this is really kind of shows some of the capability and you can follow the link here and learn more about the EcoStress um, mission. Um, and it's been flying, I said, for a number of years, and, and, and the data is available. And you know, hopefully, we can continue to justify the use of EcoStress on one of the science ports on the International Space Station. We'll continue to have these observations, uh, at least for a couple more years. Uh, so, from that point, um, I'll stop, and we'll we can move to the question and answer session. Thank you, Chris, for such an informative presentation. This provided a great conclusion to the webinar series. And on behalf of everyone at RSET and from those online, thank you. As a reminder to our participants, if you have a question for Dr. Hain, please include them in the chat box. We'll get to as many as we can in the time remaining. As with previous question and answer documents, they will be posted to the training page by next week for you to access. Below is the contact information if you wish to follow up with any of the trainers. We will now proceed to the question and answer session. Well, thanks for everybody for sending in your questions. Uh, looks like we've got quite a few of them for Dr. Hain. Uh, so I guess I'll, I'll start off with the first one. Question one is, which types of satellite images are suitable for analysis of evapotranspiration for large SETI areas? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good, good. Uh, so yeah, for this question, um, you know, it, it really depends on what application you're going after. Um, you know, most of the, the energy balance methods that were, we presented here um, rely on thermal infrared imagery. Uh, you know, for our, the model that, you know, I work with Alexi, we, we run 
with uh, you know essentially moderate resolution uh, land surface temperature, you know, in the from a geostationary satellite, uh, so really looking at that mid morning rise in land surface temperature. Um, you know, those are on the scales of two to four kilometers. Um, if you really want to understand evapotranspiration off for an agricultural application at the field scale, you really need to get down to that that Landsat, you know, 30 meter eco stress, you know, 30 meter scale. Um, so, you know, really, it's it's it it's dependent on your application, and um, you know, that's you know, it's that's kind of just you know, it's it's hard to answer that as you know, for example, you know, from a you know, just a a general question, but you know, I think you know, as we showed with you know, kind of the multi-scale version of our model, you know, you need there's ways of integrating these you, thermal resol or thermal uh, information that you get at different scales. Um, so that's hopefully that kind of uh, if not, if there's a if there's a follow-up to that, I'd be happy to you know address a, a, a specific application. Great uh, question two: uh, Does the evapotranspiration decrease before the growing seasons in crops? Well, you know, generally yes. Um, so think about, you know, the you know think about what goes into you know say. Let's start with potential evapotranspiration. You know, what would happen in a situation where um, the land surface was well watered? Um, what then drives the the actual amount of evapotranspiration is things like sunlight, um, incoming long wave, um, that balance between the, you know the incoming and outgoing um, uh, short wave and long wave radiation. So you know, essentially, we call that net radiation. So um, obviously, during the warm season, that radiation is higher. Uh, during the cold season or the non-growing season, it's lower. And a lot of that comes with you know the changes in you know so the, the amount of solar energy that we get from the sun. Um, so generally, yes, less evapotranspiration in the cold season, non-growing season, more evapotranspiration in the growing seasons. Uh, and that's kind of why we have growing seasons and non-growing seasons. Great. Question three. How yield, or I guess, how can yield be predicted from ET for a particular area, say Africa? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, the hardest part with trying to predict yield is... Um, you really need good observed yield from previous years to try to, you know, build relationships between, you know, if say we have 20 years of evapotranspiration data and then 20 years of good quality yield data at the field scale, you can start to build, you know, machine and deep learning methods to try to predict yield. And, you know, there's a number of people in the community who are doing that. Um, it's definitely a... Um, you know, it's definitely done more on a, a local or regional scale. Um, there are people who are doing, you know, continental type scale uh, yield and yield um, predictions. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's a it really it really is predicated on having good training data to try to build a, a, a method or tool to predict yield. Um, but obviously, ET is at a very important quantity for how um, you know trying to build that relationship between what has happened in the past um, related, you know, with respect to ET and then, you know, what was subsequently happened in those years uh, from a crop yield standpoint. Um, and obviously, you know, there are the other, there are a lot of other indicators or, and data sets that would be needed to build such a tool. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're, they're definitely, I think the community has moved and it's made a lot of progress in the last number of years at developing methods to look at this. So I think it's a very important, uh, you know, science question for the community to focus on. Great. Uh, question four. I'm not clear about the difference between potential evapotranspiration and actual evapotranspiration. Would you clarify the difference, please? Yeah. So um, think of potential as, you know, what would happen if all of the conditions or all those drivers that control evapotranspiration were optimal? Um, you know, well watered, you know, su sufficient soil moisture, lots of, um, you know, solar insulation. Um, so essentially what would happen if there was no constraint on evapotranspiration? So that kind of sets the, you know, the, that threshold for what what would happen under those conditions. Actual ET is what actually is occurring. Um, you know, it's more of a physically based um, 
estimate of how much water is actually being transferred um, from the from the land surface to the atmosphere. Um, so that's really the difference. Potential is kind of the what would be happening under optimal conditions, and actual is actually what is happening. Great. Uh, and question number five: Can we use interpolation methods to measure evapotranspiration? Um, I'm not. Sure. 100% sure what the, what the what the what the you know whoever submitted the question meant by interpolation methods um you know we do rely on using interpolation to try to estimate you know seasonal or annual et uh, especially at the field scale where we only get landsat overpasses you know every under a best case scenario every 8 days um so we do need to to find ways to essentially take those sparse observations and then estimate ET in between Landsat overpass days. And you see with the method that we 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 presented today that, you know, one method is fusing, you know, slightly less, you know, more moderate resolution from Veers and MODIS to fill in for some of those gaps where, you know, it's complicated if you get a Landsat overpass at the beginning of the month and then one at the end of the month. Um, it may not represent rainfall events in between those two overpass days. Um, so the 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 introduction of more moderate resolution days that you know that's available on a daily time scale could hopefully fill in some of that information and you know albeit at a coarser resolution, but you know we've developed data mining machine learning tools to try to make those uh, uh, you know essentially the information we get at those scales and be able to interpolate it down to um, um, estimate the field scale. So while I say you can't use interpolate, not really use interpolation methods to measure ET, uh, you know, there's a lot of interpolation and data mining to try to fill in some of the observational gaps we have. So it's definitely an important part of the process. Great. And question six looks like it's a two-part question. So the first part is, is there any recent model to drive ET or energy balance with the absence of in-situ data? And then the second part of that is, what is the best way to estimate ET using only remote sensing? Yeah, so, you know, you know, in, in some of these energy balance models, um, we we don't necessarily need in-situ data. Um, so a lot of those methods that we, we, we like I said, we when we presented from the energy balance standpoint, um, they that's part of, you know, what remote sensing addresses with some of the issues where um, trying to get at evapotranspiration without in situ data. Um, obviously, you know, it's not fair to say we don't need any in situ data. I mean, we, you need to, you need to know what, what is the land surface you're looking at. Um, you know, it's helpful if you know what kind of crop it is for some methods. Um, and so, you know, and sometimes, you know, especially in areas where you have irrigated agriculture and more arid, uh, conditions, you know some of the some of the say model data that we tried we use to kind of initialize what the atmosphere is um, is not representative of what's actually going on on the ground. So sometimes in situ data is helpful to to um, you know correct some of those errors. So it's probably not fair to say that we don't need in situ data. I think when we have in situ data, it makes the methods more robust. Um, but generally, a lot of these remote sensing methods do not rely on in situ data. Um, for what is the best way to only use remote sensing, um, I think what we're finding is, you know, we have a number of methods from an energy balance standpoint and a crop coefficient standpoint and other methods that all have their strengths and weaknesses. And no one single model has shown to be what would be considered the best way to do it over different regional areas or different uh, ecosystems. So that's really why, you know, when you saw some of the slides from the Open ET project, it's really, you know, all of these different modeling groups coming together and, you know, realizing that it's better to work together than to compete because nobody nobody has the best method. Um, and understanding when certain methods do better over certain areas and then using an ensemble of methods tends to give us the best, um, you know, validation when we actually compare against um, actual ground-based measurements of ET where we actually have eddy covariance flux towers. So. It's really that multi-model ensemble, which is the best way to estimate ET from remote sensing. At least and Chris, it looks, it looks like question seven is actually very similar uh, to question six as well. It's, but given that the ground observation data are scarce in Africa, which models and remote sensing approaches would provide good estimates of ET? 
Yeah, I'd probably answer it the same way. Um, you know, I think, you know, these energy balance models um, don't rely on in situ data. Um, some of the crop coefficient methods that we, we talked about briefly um, really need good crop data layers to, you know, do an, an accurate estimation of the crop coefficient, which I guess we'll, we'll let me, I'll just address question eight too. So the a crop coefficient is essentially, you know, it once you estimate potential evapotranspiration or some reference ET, um, you know, potential evapotranspiration and reference evapotranspiration are kind of similar. Um, so a crop coefficient is, say, for corn has a certain crop coefficient that to estimate ET, you would take the reference ET and multiply it by that crop coefficient. So it's essentially how effective a crop is at, um, in, you know, producing transpiration. And so because some crops use more water, some crops use less water, that's why we have crop coefficients to represent those changes in, in water use dynamics across crops. So I think that's probably the best way of looking at it. Great, question nine, uh, could you uh, explain or any recommendation to estimate surface energy balance using satellite data, especially for places that lack insufficient in situ data? Yeah, so I mean, I think, you know, this is also similar to question six and seven, you know, I think these a lot of these energy balance models don't require in situ data. So they're able to be applied, um, you know, in areas where there is insufficient ground-based data. Um, you know, because remote sensing provides us a large, you know, it provides us information that we need um, for these methods everywhere. Um, and there's enough also shortwave and near-infrared observations that we can categorize or characterize the vegetation correctly in these areas where we don't actually have ground-based observations. So yeah, it's I would refer back to question six or seven. I mean, I think these it's really an energy balance question of, you know, you don't necessarily need in situ data. It can be helpful in cases, um, but it's definitely not um, something that is uh, necessary. Great. Uh, question 10. The remote sensing approach of estimating ET is good and well for estimating uh, and or determining potential ET than actual ET. Is that not? Essentially, the actual ET contains the soil moisture stress component in it. Could there be any way to include the soil moisture stress component, KS, and compute the actual ET better? Well, I mean, I think the, you know, so the point is we don't use remote sensing to estimate potential ET. Potential ET is a, it's physically what, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a function of the meteorology or the, what the atmosphere is, you know, from a ability to take in water. Um, the remote sensing approaches that we have here are estimating actual ET. We don't need to know the soil moisture because that soil moisture signal is internal in that land surface temperature signal. Um, obviously, dry soil heats up faster than wet soil. Um, and also, if you, you know, you, you know, so you don't need to know the soil soil moisture stress component. For, it's really internally in the, the surface energy balance. Um, there are some, you know, obviously from a modeling standpoint, a modeling method, you do need to know soil moisture because there is, like I said, soil moisture stress is a function of how land surface models estimate evapotranspiration. Um, so, um, you know, I think there are some, you know, there are, have been some work towards developing maybe a more of a hybrid approach where you have, a, you know, and obviously we do this with data assimilation too, of trying to assimilate remote sensing observations in the land service models. So, you know, I, I think the main take home is, you know, these methods are estimating actual ET. Um, knowing accurate soil moisture conditions can help you there, but we don't have that. You know, it's another, you know, we don't have a lot of in situ data for soil moisture. So we must rely on either A, modeling soil moisture and, and calculating ET from models, or essentially calculating ET from this thermal signature, which, you know, inherently includes the soil moisture stress component. Great. Question 11. In another webinar, we were introduced to Landsat's evapotranspiration product, EE Flux. In the presentation, there was an internet link, but it doesn't work at the moment. Where can I find this 30 meter uh, energy flux product? And we've provided a link below that takes you to a uh, 
uh, Google Earth Engine app, which which uh, uses that product. So hopefully you can click on that and explore uh, some more. Yeah, and I'll add that you know with OpenET, the EE flux method is one of the models that'll be used. Um, so you know as as OpenET becomes more, you know we're going through a lot of the the beta testing now. So um, you know there'll be a lot more ET data available. Um, at least, you know, the OpenET project is focused on the, uh, you know, the Western U.S. initially, but, you know, I know the EE Flux product, you can, you can uh, run that app through uh, and, and run it anywhere. But, um, and eventually, you know, I think there'll be other methods that will start to, uh, you know, really be able to take advantage of some of the, the Earth Engine and the cloud computing capabilities. Great. Question 12. Where can I download ET data? Um, you know, you know, this is a, this is a question where it's probably better for me to come back and edit this later and I can provide some links to some, some openly available data. Um, so, uh, it just really depends on what your application is to, uh, your focus area, uh, where, where, you know, what resolution do you want data at? What, um, how many, you know, what years of data you have? I think, um, you know, a lot of the models, um, that I presented here, um, some of them are more operational and provide, you know, long-term data sets. Um, and also sometimes it's it's best to contact the, the, the PI or the developer of a given tool um, and ask about. So we can, we can definitely come back to this and, and provide some links. Great, and question 13, how is the land surface temperature measured under trees and grasses? Well, we, 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 we don't, we don't really. I mean, I, I guess that's you know, you know. So if you take a two-source energy balance model, um, we're really looking at the temperature of the bare soil component and then essentially the canopy. Um, you know, I think on some level there is um, some need in some areas, especially in savannas, where you have um, you know sp more sparse tree cover. But it from a from a modeling standpoint is difficult that you need to almost go to a three-source model where you're also trying to model essentially you know the under the canopy state um you know it's kind of one of maybe the the, the weaknesses of, of the, you know the thermal the thermal base models um that you know we're we're missing sometimes you know important processes that happen with you know heat transfer between you know you know under the canopy and the actual uh, atmosphere so I'm not sure. I'm not sure we do that effectively with, you know, from a remote sensing standpoint. Great question. Fourteen. What are the differences between plant species when calculating ET using Landsat? Um, you know, it depends how you know. It depends what method you're using. I think some methods, you know, you need to have some characterization of the the vegetation. Um, what type of vegetation are you looking at um you know a nominal height uh you know we a lot of methods you know use some um estimate of leaf area index or the fraction of green leaf in you know a given pixel um you know for some of the 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 you know when we run these on a more regional or continental or global scale we have to make some assumptions where we don't have you know a lot of detailed information when it gets down to actual, you know, what kind of species. So we it, it, we tend to keep it more general and generic, and categorize the vegetation type. You know, you know, you know, is it a coniferous forest? Is it a deciduous forest? Is it cropland? Is it shrubland? Um, we don't necessarily discriminate beyond kind of that general land cover classification. Um, Obviously, as I said, especially with the crop coefficient method, you kind of, you know, it is better if you're able to characterize what type of crop it is just because of the different water use dynamics. Um, so for energy balance, we maybe it's not as important, um, but for um, uh, crop coefficient, it is. Um, and, you know, that, but then again, it gets kind of back to your in situ data where it's like, how much do you have and how much do you, uh, yeah, need. Okay, question 15. Multi-sensors are very good at measuring ground temperature. It is very difficult to find the swarm of locusts in the desert. I think the presence of a swarm of locusts can change the, ground, the surface ground temperature. 
Can we use these multi-sensors to observe the locust swarm activities in the desert? Um, you know, I mean, this is obviously an, an important problem right now. Um, and honestly, I'm not sure. Um, you know, I think, you know, we, we have, we have seen people start to look at trying to characterize, you know, moisture conditions to see where swarms of locusts are, are likely to be, um, or where breeding may be more optimal. Um, but I, I'm not aware of anyone using actual remote sensing to look at changes in temperature due to swarms, but you know, I, I, I'll, I can ask around and if I come back with anything, you know, I imagine if you get a dense enough swarm, that might be possible, but you know, it might also be limited by the resolution of what we actually sense uh, thermally right now. Great. Question 17. Characteristic water use curves use the same days of growing period for all different crops. Is this correct? Yeah, I think in that in that study, we you know that's one of the assumptions we're making. Um, you know, over a growing season, you know, kind of being stable. But you know, I think you know, obviously there are some differences in you know the length of that growing growing period. And and you know, I think in that case, you know, optimally those were all scaled to where um, different crops were essentially planted because um, we had good information about when those fields. Um, were active and when they were not. So, um, yes. Okay, question 18. Uh, in slide 25, which satellite do you use for microwave and how to combine with Alexi? Um, so, you know, we, there's a number of microwave sensors that provide, so we need that 37 gigahertz observation, a K band. Um, there's a number of sensors that have been up over the last 20, 30 years, and then are still up. Um, we, and a lot of those are also processed within the GPM, the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission. Um, they do their intercalibration between, you know, the, the the core GMI sensor and then all these other sensors. So, um, so that gives us a number of observations over the the diurnal or the you know the the day and night period. Um, and then we use methods to fit those into a diurnal uh, temperature signal and then there are some corrections because microwave is sensing you know thermals connected you know sensing essentially that skin temperature where microwave depending on the soil moisture is looking at a little bit of a different deeper into the soil so there is some correction in both the phase and the amplitude of the microwave signal that we have to match back to what we would have seen with with uh, thermal land surface temperature um, and you know the other caveat I always like to mention is that the microwave is coarser resolution, um, but it does give us information in a lot of areas where cloud cover really affects our ability to get uh, retrie you know retrievals of land surface temperature from thermal. And I can provide the link to where we process our um, our land surface or where we where we I'll provide a link to the the raw microwave brightness temperatures that we use in our algorithm. Okay, question 19. Uh, in field level applications for decision making process, how can Eddie be used as the proxy and how is it tied with SE? Um, you know, I think for, you know, Eddie, as I said, is really driven by that potential ET or changes in, you know, potential or reference ET. Um, so Eddie will see essentially the atmospheric signal before there's actually any response in the land surface. Um, so Eddie is a, a really powerful tool to look at potential for development of drought. It can't tell you much about what's actually happening on the ground, but it can tell you the demand that the atmosphere has. And if that's above average, that means it's going to, you know, it can rapidly deplete soil moisture. And, you know, then you can start to actually see vegetation related stress. Um, and that's what we see with ESI. Uh, we're actually looking at the physical plant response to stress, water stress. Uh, so Eddie can't tell you anything about what the plant's actually doing, but it uh, it can tell you essentially what the atmosphere, the role the atmosphere is playing in, in in with the land surface. But some of these other methods actually, like ESI, tell you what's actually happening at the plant level. Um, so really, they need to be used it together. Where Eddie's more of a early warning for the potential of drought and then ESI is actually more of an early warning for actual onset of vegetation stress.
or you know especially because we can see that stress signature before the plant actually might become damaged or browned. So if you're using only an NDVI, you're going to see it much later than you might see it in ESI. And if you're only using ESI, you know, you maybe didn't see the, the atmospheric signal that Eddie would have shown you. Okay, question 20 is very specific to a part of India. Uh, so can we get root zone soil moisture data for any region in India at high resolution, or say for a crop, cotton cultivation in the Maharashtra state? And how can we get high resolution crop specific vegetation images, say for time series cotton cultivation in a region of India or through geo coordinates of India? Um, you know, it is a very specific question. I think from a, the, the, the real answer is no. Um, you know, I, there's not really a way to, there's not really a way to directly um, estimate root zone soil moisture from any satellite. Um, uh, from the high resolution standpoint, you know, there are, you know, with, you know, current synthetic aperture radar and current, you know, up, you know, future, uh, the, the LBAN, uh, SAR from NASA and, and, uh, the Indian space agency that's coming online, you know, in the next couple of years will give us, you know, the ability to estimate you know, high resolution soil moisture. Um, also, there's, it's been shown that Cygnus, which is a, you know, essentially a, was going to be an ocean wind type mission for, you know, tropical systems um, using uh, reflected GPS signals. Um, that is also shown to be a relatively unique way of estimating um, high resolution soil moisture. Um, so definitely, we're moving towards the point where we can get high resolution surface soil moisture, but you still re you still need to rely on modeling to to kind of you know model how changes in surface soil moisture affect root zone soil moisture because we don't directly observe root zone soil moisture um, with some of the microwave instruments either active or passive. Great question twenty one. There are several types of drought. Does ESI predict hydrological drought? Generally, no. So, I mean, ESI is really a, a meteorological or agricultural drought tool. Um, obviously, you know, hydrological drought happens on much larger time scales. You know, sometimes can be driven with you know groundwater dynamics, snow melt in areas where you, you know, where snow melt relies. You know, a lot of you know water use relies on snow melt. Um, so, it's definitely not a tool that should be used for predicting hydrological droughts. Um, sometimes. You know, we obviously, you know, if an area is ex exhibiting, you know, a, a long hydrological drought, you know, we'll definitely see that in ESI 2 on some sense that we'll see, you know, obviously sometimes the, the vegetation is is feeling that change in, in, you know, you know, deep root zone soil moisture. So a lot of times um, there are, you know, there are some you know, events where the two correspond well, um, but that's, you know, there are better tools for doing hydrological drought. Um, you know, and, you know, those really are predicated on looking at, you know, snow melt, uh, precipitation over these periods, uh, groundwater changes. So, yeah, it, you know, there are times where, yes, you can technically use it, but, you know, I think it's, we really focus on its capabilities for meteorological and agricultural drought. Great. Question 22. What is the time delay that we can expect between seeing a signal of plant stress in the ESI and NDVI, so the actual uh, yeah. plant to damage. You know, I don't, I don't think we know. I mean, I think we, we kind of estimate, you know, on order of maybe one to three weeks. It just depends on how rapidly evolving the drought is. How, you know, um, but I mean, from a, from a standpoint of really trying to understand, um, that's kind of still an area of open research. And you know, I think no specific case would be, uh, you know. It it it, is, it, it it requires us to go back and look at some of these cases where we did see the you know the onset of stress in ESI before you see it in a you know an NDVI or a vegetation index. Great question twenty three. What are the potential uses of remote sensing based uh, ET monitoring for index crop insurance? Um, you know, I think on anything, it's like once you get to you know, so you know, and it depends. You know, in places in Africa where you know field sizes are very small, um, 
we really don't even at you know you know technically you know landsat the thermal sensor really you know is on the order of a hundred meters um you know we we can sharpen that down to 30 meters but when you get to some of these areas with much smaller fields you know it's hard to get a pristine view of uh you know water use at a field scale there um but it is an area it is areas that we've been working on with you know groups that are are, are focused on you know in, index crop insurance um so i think you know in the end as we get to these tools where we're able to like open et where we're able to actually produce you know operational field scale estimates of et i think it will be have a potential use for um being used in some of the you know index uh methods and for crop insurance. So I think you will expect you expect to see it probably become a bigger thing as we move forward. Great. And question 24 is actually similar in terms of uh, small field size. So a majority of farmers in India have two small holdings, two acres or less on average. How can ET help them plan their crop rotation cycles? You know, I think, you know, similar to the last question is like, you know, we're really you know, there's a, there is a constraint with resolution. Um, you know, I think as you know, as future as future sensors come, you know, maybe we get to the point where we have higher resolution thermal. Um, but I think also it's this, you know, a lot of these methods are not operationally produced. And as that as those capabilities continue to grow, it'll make it it'll make it easier for farmers to start to integrate this into their decision making. Um, where now it's really getting good you know accurate information kind of occurs on the retroactive scale um so um something i think going forward you'll see more but i mean depending on your your the size of your fields that you want to resolve it's really is constrained by you know our you know essentially the technology of you know the thermal acquisitions great question 25 why is abhrr not used in alexi to achieve a longer time series um not because we don't want to um it's just an area of active research for us um avhrr is complicated in some of the earlier sensors because there's a lot of drift of the sensor where it over time or its life cycle will observe the land surface at a different time um, as you have orbital drift um so that requires just a more complicated technique um, than what we've applied from Modus or Veers. Uh, but it's definitely an area that we we are actively working on. So it's not it's not that we don't plan to do it. It's just a matter of uh, we're not there yet. Great. And last question, are Alexi and Alexi ESI available at the global level? Um, yes. Um, we run both Alexi and, you know, the ET and the ESI data from Alexi at uh, about five kilometers globally. Um, the ESI is produced you know, near real time and is available for download. And I can add the link here after we're done. And then um, the ET data is more of a retrospective tool, but we're, we're working on getting it run more, more of a near real time mode. Um, you know, so, so yes, I mean, and those kind of serve as the boundary condition for our disaggregation or dyslexia tool um, for when we want to run that field scale method over different areas of the globe. Wonderful. Well, we we did it. We got through all the questions. Uh, we are at time, so I guess uh, so. Yeah, thank you. And Chris, I want I want you to know a lot of the the information we've been getting from the participants has been just very positive and and very thankful for for everything you've been doing. And on behalf of RSET as well, thank you so much for contributing to this webinar series. No, no, happy to do it. Thanks. Great. And I also want to acknowledge all of uh, the RSET colleagues that helped make this possible. Uh, that's Dr. Amita Mekta, uh, Dr. Erica Potist, uh, Selwyn Hudson Odoi. Brock Blevins and Jonathan O'Brien. So thank you all. Thanks everybody for joining. And uh, again, uh, the homework is due on May 12th. So please get that in and all the content from the Q&A session, as well as the materials uh, from the presentation are up on the website. So please go there to access them and hope you all stay safe and we'll, we'll see you soon. Thank you.